you. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. It's Leslie with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center, and I'm here with uh, Christopher Garcia, and he always gives such a great webinar, and he answers lots of questions and gives lots of great information. And this is going to be e-commerce and alternative selling methods. I would like to uh, tell everyone that the New Mexico Small Business Development Center strongly encourages New Mexico businesses to be aware of cybersecurity risk. And we have two webinars that you can uh, register for. Our webinars are closing 24 hours in advance. Next week on Wednesday, we have top 10 mistakes hackers want you to make. We also have the following week on Tuesday, we have cybersecurity basic steps for small businesses. So we'd like to remind everyone to take advantage of it. Type your questions in the Q&A and I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Leslie. Hi everyone, thank you for spending time with me today and welcome to my e-commerce and alternative selling methods webinar. My name is Christopher Garcia and I'm the business development specialist at the SPDC at UNM Valencia campus. I created this webinar based on a great article called Selling Without a Store by Tamara E. Holmes. And you'll receive a copy uh, of this article after the webinar. And in fact, let me show it to you now. Here's the email you should expect following this webinar. Maybe give me a day or two, but you'll get it, I'm, I, I assure you. And here's um, all of the links and documents that I'm gonna talk about in the webinar today. Let's go back to our slideshow. Perfect, perfect. Before we begin, let's go over some webinar ground rules. Everyone on the call right now is muted, so don't worry about background noise. And there is a feature to raise your hand, and I'll use that throughout the webinar. So in fact, let me see by a show of hands, who could see and hear and make, I just wanna make sure everybody's okay. So if you could see here and everything's going well, please raise your hand for me. Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna lower everybody's hand. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and I'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation. And in fact, just to make sure everybody could use the Q&A and it's working okay, if you'd send me a hi, hello, how are you, como estas? Something in the Q&A just to let me know that it's working. Hello, Van. Hello, Jana. Hello, Rhonda. Or good morning, Rhonda. Perfect. You guys are doing great. Perfect, perfect. And let's see if you want to talk, this, this is a dated slide, but it, let's say if you want to um, shout out the upcoming trainings, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. So I did update and hello, everybody. I want to update everyone on what we've got going on because we have so many different webinars for you and your business. Um, this week, right after we get done, we're going to have basic steps to starting a business in New Mexico. We also have this week financial resources, a bilingual session. We have intellectual property pirates part two. So you can attend that live. We also have pre recorded on demand part one. We have your most important online stat you cannot ignore. And then going into the beginning of next week, we have should my business be accepting cryptocurrency? Perfect. And like Leslie mentioned earlier, cybersecurity is a big um, threat for small businesses. So please take advantage of our courses related to that. Here are the objectives for our uh, and the agenda for our webinar. I'll explain how the SPD can assist you, introduce you to a marketing plan, 
introduce methods for taking your business online or selling in a different way, and provide practical resources to assist your business with an online presence. It's a lot to cover in one webinar, but I think we could do it, and I'll do a recap at the end just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Here is a graphic of our center locations throughout New Mexico, and the mission of the SBDC is to build skilled entrepreneurs and strong businesses by offering no-cost confidential business counseling and lower no-cost training events, like this one. You'll notice a small blurb at the bottom of the slide, and that's from our major funders. Um, our major funders include the State of New Mexico and the Small Business Administration. That's what SBA stands for. Uh, <clears throat> And now I'm going to tell you more about the SBDC in the next few slides. Let's talk about the services of the SBDC. We offer two major services, confidential business counseling and lower no cost business trainings, like I mentioned earlier. And there are no limits to how much no cost counseling you can receive or how many no cost trainings you could attend. We have centers throughout New Mexico, so there'll be one close to you. And if you look at the graphic in the upper right hand corner, it shows what we strive to do. And let me move my picture so I could see it myself. We strive to renew, grow, launch, and start up small businesses. We welcome you to our statewide trainings like this one and to participate on your center's webinars and workshops. This slide shows what we expect from our clients. My fellow at business advisors and directors want you to succeed, so you'll be assigned homework or further research. So please do the work necessary to succeed. We can't make decisions for you or offer tax or legal advice. We could only connect you to the resources you need to make an educated decision. And part of making an educated decision is working with licensed professionals like attorneys or accountants. Finally, I want to remind you about our important surveys we sent out as part of attending these trainings. Everyone who registered for this webinar received an email from Leslie Everson saying, in anticipation of the upcoming e-commerce and alternative selling methods webinar event that you have registered for, we would like to collect some preliminary information from you. And with this information in hand, we can tailor the course materials to better fit your needs. So by a show of hands, I want to make sure, did uh, who received the the pre-webinar survey in an email. Good, good, good. It doesn't look like very many did. So please check your spam box. And thank you for those of those of you who did. Please do the, the pre-webinar um, survey and then you'll receive another email after and that would be the follow-up survey for this event. So, if you'd please do both because they are part of our funding with the Small Business Administration and it's very important to provide your feedback to us so we could make um, better decisions in the future to serve you well. Okay, now I want to tell you guys why is mark why is a mark uh, why a marketing plan is important uh, when changing or adding selling methods or transitioning your storefront to an online uh, marketplace. It's because online sales is about identifying your target market or markets, analyzing your product or service offerings, creating a profitable pricing strategy, and successfully distributing your products and services, and then effectively promoting those products or services. And I mentioned the four Ps. So I talked about target market and then the four Ps, product, price, place, and promotion. And it's important when you're when you're creating your marketing plan to create benchmarks to track your results and analyze your outcomes. And on the slide, I have a link for further learning. This is the link to the let's go to it. It's for the SBA's marketing 101. Oh, look at my links giving me trouble on my web webinar today. That's okay because we have it around here in the follow-up email. I think I just put it in the slides for you guys. So let me tell you, let me take you to the SBA's website because it's a wealth of information. 
So this is what the SBA's website looks like. And then they have a learning platform right here. And it opens to the two main uh, learning platforms, the Learning Center and then Ascent for Women. So all the women on the call right now, there's a special program. It's a, a totally online and it's about uh, starting and growing your business. It's very, very good. So please take advantage of that. Men, take advantage of it as well, because it's really cool. I, for the marketing one, you go into the Learning Center and then the, they have a um, 52 objective webinar series. It's, it's a short video series on marketing. And that's what I base my marketing class off. So they have market, the marketing 101 and they have in, inside of the marketing 101, there's some marketing worksheets. And if there are any two things you take away from this marketing discussion, it's to take a look at this marketing 101 checklist and the marketing 101 guide, uh, a guide to winning customers. So let me open the checklist for you. So when you're deciding, should I go online? Should I transition to some of my products online? Um, should I start a pop-up shop because it's been really hard with COVID? My customers may not be in the area where I'm located anymore. Or maybe I wanna test out a new area. There's cheaper rent here. Um, you could do that with a pop-up shop. If you're a restaurant and you want to start a food truck or if you're wanting to just start a food truck uh, this is a great way just to see who is my target market what are, are their needs and wants and uh, what kind of media or um, advertising are they taking in so I could make decisions about how to best promote my products or services and it's a short checklist it's only three pages please take a look at that for your business it's, it, it, it's, it's well worth the time. And then there's the guide to winning customers, which is basically my slide that I went over in this, this uh, talk I'm gonna give you about mar uh, marketing in a nutshell. Um, and if there's anything you do, I would do this twice a year at least as a business owner. Uh, it helps you to really identify your target market, see if the interest of your target market have changed, see if your distribution method for your target market has changed. Uh, and really help you make those um, benchmarks and goals and analyze the your promotional activities. So this has a lot of, um, my favorite is the return on investment, but some of the ratios that are used in marketing. And I'll talk about these a little bit more. Okay, perfect. Every activity you do in your business should align with your target market or markets, because these are the customers most likely to purchase your product, AKA, AKA those customers you don't mind spending money on to uh, advertise or promote to. If you think everybody in the United States is your target market, oh my gosh, you're dead wrong and you'll probably go broke trying to uh, advertise to that target market. So you really have to find, as a small business owner, you have to find your niche, find your niche target market and, and best um, promote your products to them. <clears throat> you want to create an avatar in your mind. That's what they talk about a lot in marketing webinars and workshops, creating an avatar of the ideal customer. And that is your target market. I'll also show you a great research tool offered to you at no cost by the SBDC. Um, and that's there's a few of them. There's Mintel Marketing Reports, there's um, Reference USA, and then there's Ibis World. And these are all tools that could help you with business planning and also marketing planning. So it, I want to use the example of a women's clothing store in Berlin when I'm talking to you in this webinar, because there was a successful women's clothing store in Berlin. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's, it blends a lot like a lot of the small communities around New Mexico, and I think it'd be a good example. But their sales are way down because of COVID, so they want to take their their business online a bit a bit. So the ideal customer would be a woman with a household income of a hundred thousand or more, uh, purchases high end clothing and shops online. If the clothing uh, they sold was Western wear, you might look for those women with interest in bull riding, farming, and country music. And if your product was modeled after a famous country music singer, you might want to target those who listen to country music. 
Now that we have identified our ideal customer, we can tailor the products and services to their needs and wants. The research tool I'll talk to you about later suggests the most popular products in women's clothing are accessories, tops, bottoms, and dresses, and outerwear. I've also been selling, uh, so in this example, the, the store has also been selling uh, products in the store because they have a storefront, so they know what products are hot sellers, high profit items, and unique to their store. It's important to keep your online inventory very lean because you are charged per posting, per photograph, per sale, and it's uh, very time consuming to photograph items for sale online, write descriptions for them, uh, post them, accept orders, ship orders, and handle returns and exchanges. And also talk to your customers if they have a question for you, you, you should be able to answer it within two days. So when you're putting your products online, make sure to choose profitably and wisely. The next one, price. Price is a very important factor in online sales. You may have lower overhead when selling online, but you have other costs to think about like posting fees, payment fees, monthly subscription fees, yearly website fees, website and online questions. Who's gonna answer those questions? It's gonna take some time and time for returns and exchanges and that comes with a cost. It also entails navigating through websites, online marketplaces and payment processors. Do you have the skills you need or do you need to hire somebody to help you out with this? There are many other online sellers selling your product for more or less, so research the selling price online. And there are two common methods for setting a price, cost plus and market pricing. If you have a unique product, you can set a price by figuring the cost and adding a markup. If you sell a common product, you can research the selling price on online marketplaces uh, by visiting websites like Google Shopping, Amazon.com. Uh, you could do just a search on Yahoo and just researching those prices. When you sell on an online marketplace like eBay, Amazon, Etsy, they tend to, they have the data. They could see what other people selling a similar product to you are selling it for, and they could recommend a price range for you. Usually, if you want to show up very prominently in the search for that particular item, you have to be the price leader. And uh, to do that, you really have to make sure you're adjusting your price online um, rapidly and according to what other people are selling that product for. Because we don't, we don't have to go to a shopping mall and, and compare prices from store to store anymore. We could go online and we could get a list of all those products with all the selling prices, shipping prices and taxes. We are selling on, uh, so since we're selling online, why is the place or distribution important? It's because you have more choices than ever for selling products online and fulfilling orders. You can choose to sell your products from your website. You could use an online marketplace. You could offer pickup or delivery through a third party or use a third party app for pickup like uh, Amazon Hub. And I thought it was pretty um, forward thinking of Amazon to put an Amazon Hub at the all subs in Los Lunas. Um, I thought that was pretty neat. After figuring out our product price and place, you have to think about promotion. And there are more ways to promote your business than ever before. Some common methods are blogging on your website or vlogging, creating a website, personal selling, which is contacting people in your target market personally. Uh, you could do social media marketing, uh, word of mouth and reviews. Reviews are very important when you're selling online. Reviews often uh, give you better search engine optimization or SEO. And you might hear that term SEO a lot. It just means how databases like uh, or uh, algorithms within databases like eBay, Etsy, Google, Yahoo, um, per, uh, create relevancy for your product. So the more relevant your product is to the people searching for it, the higher it's gonna show up in search results. And this works across all of these online marketing platforms. And usually they use keywords so when you think when you're wanting to buy some advertising on something like Etsy, say you sell uh, women's uh, uh, country uh, or um, women's Western wear boots, you're going to want to think of uh, and I'll use an example later in this in this webinar to we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But you're going to want to use keywords that are very relevant to the search, and those those are sometimes they're hard to think about. 
But there's tools like Google My Business, which tracks the keywords uh, people are using to search for your business profile. And that could come in handy. They also have a keyword um, uh, like tool in Google that tells you what are the hot search terms that are happening in Google right now. Um, and I could get into that more in the Q&A if you have any questions about it. And then some interesting ways to promote your products online include paying or giving free merchandise to bloggers or bloggers. These are commonly called influencers to promote your product. And they usually just talk about it in their video. I see it a lot when I, um, I watch unboxing videos. I don't know if you guys have seen these on YouTube. Or if you follow a lifestyle expert, there used to be this um, uh, channel on YouTube called Cheap Thrills. And this uh, very funny guy would make crafts. It, it was a hoop. But they would often advertise products um, that they were sent for free. Or if people gave them money to advertise a product, they have a little disclaimer. And, and uh, they talk about it a bit. For the women's Western wear store, you might consider sending a YouTube lifestyle expert who caters to women in that target market to promote your unique merchandise. You could use Facebook ads to target women with uh, selected interests in places where Western wear is popular, or you could send a postcard to your repeat clients or your current clients at your storefront, letting them know you have an online store. So those are a few uh, common ways to promote your product or service. So after you make your decisions about the four Ps, think about promotional goals like reaching 100,000 viewers on, uh, with the Facebook ad, track the results and calculate your return on investment. So if you spend $100 on a Facebook campaign and reach 75,000 viewers, the cost per viewer is um, less than a penny. And that's an amazing campaign. Uh, hopefully, you know, just because people viewed your ad, that doesn't mean they've actually visited your site and bought something. So also, um, Calculating how much, how many people actually went to your site from Facebook is important and how many purchases were actually made. And they have a great tool for that. It's called Facebook Pixel. Google has a tool for that too. It's Google Analytics. Um, a lot of WYSIWYG website builders and what WYSIWYG stands for is what you see is what you get. Those are things like Weebly, WordPress, uh, Squarespace, GoDaddy. They often have a tracking for that as well. They're called cookies, and I often have to attest that it's okay for the cookies when I visit websites. To learn and to learn more about marketing, please consider visiting that uh, SBA's Learning Center. And in fact, you know what? I'll I'll chat over that link directly to everybody since this one's not behaving properly. Let me do that now. panelists and attendees. Okay, I chatted over that link right now. Perfect. Okay. So I, I just want to see by a show of hands, how many of you have a storefront now? and you're wanting to transition to some online sales. Perfect, perfect, okay, David, very good. So I'm guessing the rest of the attendees want to just go into online sales as a business startup. So that's, that's good. I think that I geared this webinar towards those who have a physical presence now and want to transition online but the information is good for both. And if you have any specific questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer them. Let's see, my slideshow is acting up. There we go. Perfect. So now let's talk about selling online. Many people think it's less expensive and easy to sell online, but that isn't always the case. You must really research your options, fees, and staffing to make sure you have the time 
and staff to successfully sell online. There are two op main options for selling online. You could sell directly from your website, or you could use a, a third-party app like Shopify to add to your website, or you could sell directly through an online marketplace like Amazon, Etsy, or eBay, or you could do a, a combination of both. The pro of selling from your website is you save on marketplace fees. The con is you're doing all your own marketing, search engine optimization, web maintenance, you're tracking orders on your own and you're taking on the liability of processing and storing sensitive data. Using an online marketplace is a bit easier because they process payments, track orders, create policies. Uh, they market your products across the web. So these days, if you search for a product, say in Google Shopping, uh, say I'm searching for, um, uh, like I was this morning, uh, glass lens cleaner. If somebody's selling it on Amazon, eBay, Etsy, it will show up in the Google Shopping search because they have they have a way of doing that, and they have they uh, they also they also market to products across the web to their existing customers. Uh, if you've ever bought anything from Amazon, Etsy, or eBay, uh, you probably constantly get email updates. I get about three a day from eBay saying this is a product you might like. Here's ten dollars off if you buy a, an electronic item and they have an established clientele. So a lot of times people are visiting these sites passively just to see what's new, um, what's available to them. If you don't have a website already, you have to create one. Whether you use a web designer or an online website builder, there are three components to every website, the domain or web address, the code, or, the, or what we actually see when we go to a website, and a host, which is basically um, like a storage unit for your data. All these have a cost associated with them. We, then they require monthly or annual payment. Uh, you have to have, make sure you have maintenance so you can maintain the accounts and choose your provider wisely. When opting to sell online, ask yourself if you have the process and staff to successfully sell online. There must be someone to list items, change prices, photograph your items. That's the part that uh, gets me most of the time is photographing items. You have to write compelling product descriptions or be able to use product descriptions from, say you, um, you sell, you're a distributor for a, a common product. Maybe they come with product descriptions. You have to maintain a website or e-commerce profile. And often if you sell on an e um, online marketplace, they offer a direct website link for you. Uh, at least Etsy does, eBay does as well. Return customer emails, fulfill orders, ship orders, and handle returns and exchanges. Each marketplace is different, and you could use one or many, but they all require time. And remember, your garden will never grow unless you bless it with your time. Fees run about 10% for product listings and payment processing. And some marketplaces have monthly fees when using a business account. So for example, if you start with eBay and you sell under, uh, or you have under 500 products listed, it's usually about $30 a month. And adding extra videos, extra photos, or paying for uh, search engine optimization or keywords, all have fees associated with them. So make sure you're only doing what you're able to handle and afford. Don't waste money posting items across all e-commerce sites because that might they all e-commerce sites might not pertain to your target market and remember every activity you do when selling online relates back to your target market you could use an e-commerce management software that's like hootsuite or hootsuite um, you might have heard about that and if you're only selling like maybe 10 things a month it might not be profitable to create a business account online and just one more time, keep the interest of your target market in mind and use those distribution channels that appeal most to them. So if I was selling something that that was that really appealed or my largest market was for uh, maybe an older generation, maybe baby boomers, older baby boomers, people 65 plus, maybe those people aren't shopping online. Maybe online sales wouldn't be the best thing for me to do. If I have a storefront, I could probably evaluate what age, what demographic of people are coming into my store? And I could think what, what really appeals to them um, with the distribution channels. For me, I love shopping off of online and off of catalogs, I really do. 
So here's a list of popular online marketplaces. Uh, and you, most of us online will know the top three. Uh, what is it? Let's see, let me move my controls. Amazon, eBay, and Etsy. So choose your marketplaces very carefully and always keep the interest of your target market in mind. I'm gonna keep saying that throughout, so maybe you'll pick up on that. Since online marketplaces make money as you sell more products, the bigger ones have great learning resources and customer service, so keep that in mind. And I wanna show you in the follow-up email that I'm gonna send out. Let me get rid of our marketing webinar here. That I've put the learning resources for eBay, Etsy, and Amazon uh, in in the in the follow-up email. So e eBay has a seller sent Etsy's is probably the best, and I'll show you Etsy's. And the, the, it's probably the easiest to use. I love the way it's organized. I think they really capture their target market, which is mostly women in a certain age group selling online. Um, and that's really the target market for um, the SBDC as well, women about 35 to 45. And I think they just do a great job covering all the bases of being able to successfully sell on Etsy. And remember, they make about 10% when you sell on Etsy. So they wanna make sure these resources are available to you for free. Uh, Amazon also has some great resources. I attended one of the, they called it Amazon Accelerate. I, I thought it was very informational. I thought it was a little too high up there for me, but they do offer these uh, online events or in-person events. The, online, the social media uh, platforms also do that. Facebook has Facebook Boost, and they often come to New Mexico maybe once or twice a year and they give you all the best practices for marketing on Facebook. They also have a lot of cool little swag. I know Google, they give up post-its and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. They also, most of these sites also have great blogs uh, for you. So Shopify has a really great blog and they, um, they have two types of blogs. They have one blog that talks about the specifics of using Shopify. And then they have another blog or podcast, they call it too about um, actual entrepreneurs selling online and how they really have their, made their success. So keep that in mind. And then pick your marketplaces best on what's, uh, by what's best sold on them. So if you were selling hand knit sweaters, uh, Etsy would probably be your best bet. And then I wanna, um, that's about all I want to go over with this slide. Let's go to the next slide. And when selling online, product photography is vital to your success. As you can see from the image on the left, it has bad lighting and isn't very attractive versus the picture on the right that has good lighting and photo effects added. The difference speaks for itself. And I never thought I'd be so attractive to a bottle, uh, attracted to a bottle of Clamato in my life, right? Compared to the, the image on the left. If you don't have experience with product photography, take a look at Shopify's article and uh, do it yourself or hire a local photographer. Uh, a local, the local photographers are probably in dire need of business and they'll probably offer you a good rate for product photography. You could use a stock image website uh, or ask your wholesale, if you're a, 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 if you're a retail distributor for a wholesaler, ask your wholesalers if they have uh, images of their products they'd they like you to use. And be careful when using photos found online because they may be copywritten. And I'll show you an example of how to go on Google and find images that have a Creative Commons license. So I have two links to our great articles about product photography. And I also inclu I included those links in the follow-up email. There's the, there's the photography links right there. Let's go back to our slideshow. I also wanted to show you a great service. I use the example of Fiverr, but there's other ones like Upwork and um, Upwork and TaskRabbit. So on sites like these, um, 
independent contractors post ads for things like product photography. And they do it uh, oftentimes at a reasonable rate because we remember this is the Small Business Development Center. I don't wanna just suggest that you read the article, become a professional photographer and do it yourself. Think about taking advantage of a small business like this, a small business in your area. And these are photographers who will do, or independent contractors who will do product photography for you. And they often charge a small fee. And this is a great way to source um, contract labor for your business. Uh, at uh, prices that aren't that high. Here's uh, an example of a stock image website. Uh, Shutter, you might you might think Shutterfly, uh, Pixabay. This is one uh, Les Laberson uh, showed me. It's uh, Adobe Stock, and then you could pay a monthly fee, or you could look for images like. Um, Say I'm selling a can opener. I don't necessarily have an, uh, a very pretty for photograph of the can opener I'm selling. I could find a similar stock image or I could find somebody actually using that can opener. Say I wanted to use this uh, lovely model uh, using a can opener on my uh, online store. I could do that. I could buy this photograph for a certain amount of money or I have to pay. This one looks like a, you could get it with a free trial but you probably have to pay 30 bucks a month to use photos. And this could save you some time, some money. And uh, you could see they have a, the, when these first came out, they didn't have many options, but as you could see for the keyword can opener, there are tons of options. Uh, I think more options than probably anyone would ever need for a can opener. And it's perfectly legal to use these images if you purchase them. Uh, it's not if you steal them from online. And let me show you, if I go to google.com and I went to some other site, Let's see here. And I want to search for a can opener. And I go to images. Not all, some of these images may be copywritten. So I can't just steal any of these images. I want to go to tools, usage rights, and creative commons licenses. And these are the photos that I may be able to use for free. I may be able to use in like a collage and manipulate them in some way. But as you could see with the Creative Commons license, it's a little bit more limited than with the general Google search. So make sure to keep that in mind. It's best to do the photography yourself, really, it really is. Let's go back to our slideshow. Next major thing when selling products online is to write a compelling product description. And I put two examples of descriptions on the slide. This one's a private seller on eBay, and this one's uh, from the actual product site. And this example is uh, women's boots. And uh, if you look at them closely, this the one from the private seller on eBay basically says, here's a pair of boots that are used by them. The one on the bottom really goes into some nice keywords. And I included an article to nine ways to write a product, product descriptions and inform and persuade your customers in the follow-up email. And those are next to the photography ones. There are lots of opportunities to better sell with great descriptions on sites like Amazon, eBay, and Etsy. And I've noticed that many sellers on Amazon may not speak English as their primary language. So things get lost in translation. For example, I was looking for, um, a pitcher that held a certain amount of water. And in the United States, we often think in quarts, gallons, in other uh, parts of the world, they think in liters, milliliters. And it was kind of hard for me to find the size of pitcher I needed because there were, was different information. Always keep your target market in mind when writing, writing these descriptions. And in this uh, uh, example, they happen to be women's brain boots. Think about what attracts women to these boots, where, where, where they will wear these boots, and about their buying behaviors and interests. Also use compelling keywords related to your products. Keywords are words that search engines and databases closely associate with a product or service. If I were talking about boots, I might use keywords like waterproof, leather, rubber, 
comfortable, durable. And in the example on the bottom, Chuka U Sleep, plush, waterproof, rubber outer sole, self cleaning, and rainproof. So it sounds like they really understand their target market's needs and wants when they're picking out their wording for their product descriptions. Okay, now that we talked about online sales, we're gonna go into the alternative selling method part. So I wanna talk about pop-up shops and I group those with flea markets. And this, these are, are the topics that Tamara E. Holmes talks about in her article. And she wrote this article in 2012, so she was very much ahead of her time. Okay, let's, okay, let's, I, I group these together because they have many of the same requirements. They just cater to two different markets. So pop-ups cater to a higher end market and flea markets cater to a more general audience. Pop-up shops are a lot of work and take lots of planning because you have to follow state and municipal and county licensing requirements. So basically what a pop-up shop is, is it's me taking my storefront into another place. So I like to use the example of a spirit Halloween store, but let me talk to you about permitting first. Uh, you have to get the proper inspections, you have to purchase insurance, which is optional but vital, and it takes a lot of market research and planning. Pop-up shops are usually used by established brands are in a great, and are a great way to take your online product to a storefront, test a new product or product bundle, and test a location or a demographic. So say I have a store in Los Unas, I want to branch out maybe into Albuquerque, what part of Albuquerque might be best for me to locate a store? Uh, you could do demographic research. You could do a pop-up shop, test the location. So let's take a deeper dive into permitting and licensing by looking at R in our follow-up email. Basic steps to starting a business guide or our quick start guide. I like to use the quick start guide. And my mind works backwards, it seems, so I go from the bottom up. So usually if you have an established brand, you'd set up your corporate structure. That could be a sole proprietorship, a limited liability company, a corporation. Um, and then you've applied for an employer ID number, a FEIN, and that's a, an identification number through the IRS. You uh, had to have uh, applied for a gross receipts tax ID number and that's through the taxation and revenue department. And then the most tricky part for pop, especially for pop-up shops and food trucks is applying for a business license. So this lists the common or the, the areas in Los Unis where you apply for a business license, Los Unis, Socorro County and some of Torrance County. Uh, they have a cost associated with them. But when you're going into a physical storefront, you have to make sure you're thinking about things like Adults with Disability Act, uh, access, you have to think about, do I have a formal lease agreement with the property owner? Because if you don't, and you go to Valencia County to try to use the business address to get a business license, you're not gonna have very much luck unless you have a, st a stipulated use of that property from the landlord. Um, let's see what else. And it takes a lot of, a, a lot of um, pre-planning with the municipality. And the regulations in most municipalities or counties for temporary vendor permits. So if I only wanted to do this for maybe three days, I'd get a temporary business permit. If I wanted to do it for longer than three days, I'd get a full permit. But most of the laws related to these were created in the 1910s and 20s. And they govern businesses like revivals, traveling carnivals and circus, circuses, and door-to-door -door salespeople. So this goes to show how long it's been since most um, places have thought about mobile commerce. So this means government hasn't caught up with uh, reality. So there may be a there may be some extra paperwork you might, might have to do related to pop-up shops. So let's take a, a look at some of the examples of pop-up shops I use in our slideshow. The one that comes to my mind. Uh, being from uh, growing up in Albuquerque is the Spirit Halloween store. I remember when I was a child, uh, these popped up around September and they'd usually go into a vacant storefront. I remember they went into a vacant Walgreens by uh, my neighborhood. And uh, they have an online presence all year round, but they pop up during the Halloween season. 
They also do these kind of uh, Halloween pop-ups within thrift stores. I remember Savers used to do them. Goodwill often does them. Great way to test a product or service. Great way to cater, cater to a demographic in an area. So say you're from a rural area, maybe like Los Unes, New Mexico. You see maybe there isn't uh, a lot of options for um, wedding services or wedding products. You could do a pop-up maybe in uh, May, June. That's popular times for weddings. And you could cater to those um, couples ready to get married. Let me give you a look at West Elm. So West Elm is an online uh, high-end furniture dealer. Very beautiful uh, website, very beautiful store. So what they did is they went into um, a major retail outlet, a major mall with a big name, some big Macy's. And uh, they had a pop-up shop of their furniture in that store. So this was them taking their online presence into a physical store to see if those customers really resonated. And it could mean that they're distributing their products through that store. This could mean they actually create a storefront. Let's go back to our slideshow and get rid of some of these tabs. Mene, M-E-N-E. -E. Uh, Mene is a, a jewelry manufacturer that works in 24 karat gold. They decided to create a pop-up within Selfridges in London. And if uh, you're not familiar with Selfridges, it's like a high-end Macy's sort of full service department store in London, catering to a high-end market. So they thought maybe if they brought their jewelry there, they might have a, um, they might be able to target the customers that are walking into that store. It's a great arrangement for both the store and for the online retailer because there could be a contract for rent. Uh, there could be a, a portion of the sales going to the storefront. So it's, you know, it's helping all those involved. Let's go back to our slides. And the most appetizing of all of these pop-up shops is probably the Cheetos pop-up in uh, Tribeca in New York City. So Cheetos, just probably to create brand awareness, they probably thought most of their demographic was in that Tribeca area of uh, New York City, or they thought they'd get a lot of their target market to pass that way. They uh, rented a space, they created a pop-up restaurant, they hired a celebrity chef, and they opened this restaurant for maybe, I don't know, maybe a month. And they had the chef create recipes using Cheetos. And it was uh, just a great way for them to get publicity. As you see, this was picked up by some uh, newspaper in New York City. So it was a great way to generate advertising, demonstrate their products, uh, see if that target it resonated with their target market in that area. Perfect. Let's go back to our slides. Okay, keeping with the offerings in Tamara E. Holmes' article, Selling Without a Store, she talks about food trucks. And just like with pop-up shops, food trucks and carts are permitting intensive and require great logistic skills. In order to operate a food truck, you need to be in compliance with the New Mexico Department of Health as a mobile kitchen. And this requires using a commercial kitchen as a commissary. After that, you have to find a commercial space to park your food truck or your cart. And this means contacting property owners and managers, creating a contract to lease the space and consistently parking or using that area. And you should consider a location with lots of traffic and a high concentration of your target market. And you could, you could research these things. These things. You wanna make a follow-up appointment with your business advisor. You could make a follow-up appointment with me if you'd like. And we could go into these research tools a little bit further and see how they could help you with these, these projects. So this type of distribution is great for testing a new product or for an established brand testing a location for a business. It's important to make good working relationships with your chosen areas planning and zoning department. I would say um, Albuquerque probably has the most um, uh, planning and zoning requirements, and I included a link to uh, the City of Albuquerque's food truck permitting guide. 
because if you don't make a, a good relationship with the municipality or city, uh, you're going to have trouble. I mentioned target market earlier, and you need to draw awareness to your new business, and this means promotion. How are you going to reach your target market, especially if you're in more than one location? So you will need a website. You will need to advertise on social media. Do you want to do a postcard mailing? It all depends on your market research and the target market you serve. So I want to show you some examples of uh, food trucks in my local area using um, a website or a social media platform to probably promote their business for low or no cost. So this happens to be a food truck that I pass every day on my way to and from my house. The great thing about this is this food truck happens to consistently park in the same place all the time. Another great thing about it is, is they have a, a presence online where you could call. Uh, they have videos, they have a menu online. I think this works very well for them. And for people exploring uh, food trucks online, because in the rural areas of New Mexico, you can't just pass by an empty lot and expect a food truck to be there. In the city, there, there might be one. But in places like Los Unas, Socorro County, you probably need an online presence just to promote your product or service. Okay, let's go back to our slideshow. And the next two are um, food trucks that just have a Facebook page, but they're promoting their business through Facebook. And if you had a food truck, you could list places you're gonna be, uh, you could post pictures of your products or uh, products. You could create a schedule, you could post a menu. And the one of the most important things for um, promotion is reviews. You could get reviews from your customers. And probably those food trucks with better reviews do better than those with lower reviews. Let's go back here. And just like when selling online, pictures and descriptions uh, are, are golden for you. If you could create a, a great image, a great description, I think this is a really great image for this food truck. I think you're doing very well. So some research tools that I want to talk to you. Market research is vital. And hold on just one second. And I want to demonstrate some of these research tools for you just so you can have an idea of what the SPDC has to offer. And I'm getting close to my time. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I go into some free ones like Census Business Builder and some very vital ones that the SPDC offers to our customers. And if you were to buy these IBIS World Reports, they would cost you upwards of $800. So let me quickly show you IBIS. Close my 100 windows I have open. And bear with me, guys. Hopefully, uh, the database is cooperating this morning. The moment of truth. Let's see if it quickly lets me log in. So let's look at coming to, uh, since we talked about food track, let's look at food track. And they have reports on many, many industries, many, many industries. And let me show you the kind of report that comes from the food trucks. This is great for business um, startups who need to write a business plan. This is a great tool for those in business who wanna see the five-year trends in their industry. And they also offer some insights about marketing and target market. I'll go over the high points with you guys.
So first we have our key external drivers. I like to call these our economic drivers. And this, these are the things that, that happen in the economy that go up or down that affect your business. So for food trucks, that happens to be consumer spending, consumer confidence index, which just means the consumer's outlook on the economy over the next, say, five years, healthy eating index. So I'm guessing as that goes down, food truck consumption goes up. And urban population, I'm guessing as the area becomes more urbanized, uh, there's more need for a food truck, probably very expensive storefront space in Albuquerque, so they would have to go into a store uh, food truck. And agricultural price index, so the cost of food. It tells you who your suppliers are, and then it tells you who your first tier and second tier buyers are. For food trucks, this is a retail establishment, it's consumers in the U.S., if you manufactured a food product, say you manufactured, um, you uh, ground sugar cane into granulated sugar, you would serve both retail outlets and customers. This gives you an example of which of your drivers are going up or down over the next five years. And they venture to take a guess on is revenue gonna grow or decline over the next five years. Profit it gives us a profit margin, so at a food truck, uh, your profits four cents out of every dollar. So that tells me that you're working in volume. So you wanna keep your offering slim. You wanna keep your prices probably uh, reasonable and you wanna to sell to as many people as possible. This will let me know if how many businesses, if businesses growing or declining over the next few years. Same with employment and wages. This tells me the biggest product and service segmentations across the United States. So if I was starting a business, I'd want to look at this and say, what am I offering and is it wanted by customers in my area? So it looks like American food burgers beats out um, all the other types of food. You might also want to look at this and think, uh, there's nobody serving Greek or Mediterranean food in my area. That might be a great uh, idea for a food truck that's open maybe four days a week. A lot of us hear about the V-shaped recovery in the news. It just means the economy tanked in 2020 because of COVID and is expected to go ah, about to where it was before COVID-19. Um, and if, for those of you starting a business, think that economy is gonna take a while to bounce back to where it was before COVID-19. And inflation's going up, the price of food's going up. Um, so the supply chain has been disrupted. That means uh, these manufacturers have had to shut down for certain periods of time. Here is uh, where your business is in the, in, in the business life cycle. Food trucks happen to be in the quantity growth. If I was starting a business, I would wanna go into a business that was in quality or quantity growth. That means that there is a good prediction that there's gonna be more businesses in that industry popping up. products and services again. And then what I'm looking for is the marketing segments. So here it is. So the major markets for food trucks are consumers aged 25 to 44, uh, and then consumers aged 55 and over. So if I was wanting to cater to consumers 55 and over, uh, since I've done the market research before, maybe a campground, it might be great for me to go to a campground and put my food truck up. If I'm catering to consumers 25 to 44, maybe a music festival, maybe a more urbanized area where there are young workers uh, going to lunch. And then you have different age groups. If I was doing a full service restaurant, this might be um, income levels. So I'm catering to those with an income of 100, a household income of 100,000 or more, and then different levels below that. So it's just great information to know, help you plan, help you grow. A little rhyme for today. Okay, and now I want to show you a free one, one that you could access today. You might not want to access it or want to help with it, so make sure to make an appointment at Census Business Builder. And I just Google everything. I'm a big Google person. You always want to go to the census.gov version of Census Business Builder. Then I'll go to the, if I, if I was um, in a large area, 
the small business edition works pretty well. If I, I mean, if I was in a small area, so say Los Unas, New Mexico, Belen, New Mexico, the small business edition works pretty well. We're gonna use food trucks as an example here. And if your industry isn't listed in those pop-up options, you could search for your NAICS code or NIAC code. And if you need help finding your uh, NAICS code, please reach out to your SBDC advisor because we have to put one in your file for you. Then you could search based on county. I could look at Valencia County. So maybe I'm the only um, hardware store in Valencia County. That might be a great option. Maybe I'm serving just Belen. This database is a little finicky. You have to wait until the drop down comes up. And in this example, we want to use Belen. And I could also use zip codes. You could explore information on a map or go to the report. I like to read and learn. So I go directly to the report. And this report gives you demographic information about that selected search area, gives you population, um, breaks it down by age, race, race, uh, socioeconomic characteristics, tells you educational attainment, median household income. And a rule of thumb for me is if I wanted to do something in a retail type establishment business, I would go for those with uh, median household incomes at or above the national average. Belen happens to be below. The national average is around 60,000 a year. But that's not to say a, a retail establishment won't work in an area under the national average. The housing characteristics are for my tradespeople on the line. If I'm wanting to explore an area to start my business, I could see, I would probably wanna look at the, the average um, price of a, of a house in the area. I wanna look at the average age of the houses in that area. And then my most, uh, my, my favoriteest or most favorite part of this report is the consumer expenditures. And it lists expenditures, household expenditures per year in certain categories. And if I was gonna start a food truck, I'd probably wanna see how much people or how much households are spending per year on lunch away from the home in Belen. Uh, some funny ones include footwear, and uh, the one that makes me laugh is the dating services. And as you could see, expenditures per household on pet services. Uh, if I was a dog groomer, there probably is only room for one dog groomer in Belen, and I believe there is only one dog groomer in Belen. Let me go over using social media as a marketing tool. Many people come to my office and tell me social media marketing is gonna change their business outcomes, but that's far from the truth. I wanna show you, I, I want to show you when you, when the, show you the when and why about social media marketing by concentrating on Facebook. Before you begin any social media marketing effort, do market research and put intense thought into your target market or markets. If you don't know how, uh, who you are serving and what they like, you'll have little success on social media. Uh, the target market on Facebook tends to be women 35 to 55 with higher incomes and have, has typical consumer interests. If you have a retail store or restaurant, this is a great place to start or a new business. When you dive into a social media platform, think about using their paid advertising services and learn how to use them. I put a link in the follow-up email for Facebook's learning platform that's called Facebook um, uh, Blueprint. And they also have Facebook IQ, which is their blog. And they give you a lot of information about how to use ads, how to create effective Facebook posts. And it's just a must. It's just a must if you plan to go into social media marketing. Okay. Other awesome resources. Some other helpful resources are listed on this slide. My favorite and most practical is Google My Business. Um, and if there's anything you take away from today, if you have an existing storefront or you're gonna start a storefront, take advantage of the Google My Business services. The address is google.com slash business on another slash. Maybe it's not another slash.
Maybe the site's down, who knows? Maybe I'm spelling it wrong, you never know. If you uh, don't have a Google My Business account, let me show you an example of what it is. You could see some examples right here and it looks like it's from the phone. But the small business, as soon as when we search for it, this shows on the right side of the screen. And what Google My Business does is it allows you to control some of the options on this side of the screen because Google is a database. They want uh, the most up-to-date information because that's what their clients look for. So who could give you the most up-to-date information better than the business owners themselves? You could get reviews. You could uh, put in blurbs about your business and you could do what they call posts. So if I was a food truck and I wanted to post a special on lengua tacos, I happen to love lengua tacos. Um, I could put a post, it will show up at the bottom of the screen here. They call them updates now, they, but they're referred to as posts when you log in. And these were some posts that I put up before. Uh, I usually put when we're closed, if we're gonna have a, a webinar or a workshop. You could also drive people to a website. You could put a buy now, maybe you put a coupon, and then you could track how many people are actually finding you from Google. It's free to sign up for Google My Business. Um, you sign in by using a Gmail address. Um, if, you're, if you have a physical presence, you have to request a postcard or you could verify your business in another way. And you have more features available to you. If you're solely online or home-based, you don't have a physical location. One of the biggest perks is they provide you a very, uh, simple but effective website. So say I'm somebody who works just from home, I provide bookkeeping services, I want a website, and I'll use an example of one I helped create with a business owner. It basically creates the, the, the website based on information you enter uh, on your Google My Business profile. Uh, it gives you a choice of like seven themes, uh, but you could create a custom cover image and you could use uh, Photoshop. You could pay somebody to create this for you. You could use that, that Fiverr Upwork Task Rabbit for that. Or you could use a, I like to use a program called Canva. Let me show you Canva. And Canva basically is an online Photoshop for, for dummies. I don't like to use Photoshop because I'm not very experienced in it. Canva is much easier for me to use. And what I like about Canva is they, um, they, all, they often have um, prefab things that you could create right away with, with the specific pixels. When you're dealing with social media, online marketplaces, they often tell you you need a certain a picture that's a certain pixel wide by pixel high, by pixel high, and it's kind of complicated. But uh, pl uh, platforms like Canva make it pretty easy. You could put a little bit about yourself or your business, and then you could put a gallery of photos. So this work, this sort of thing works best for my service providers that are home based, my um, artists that are home based. Um, it's a great way to get a free website. It gives you a, a web address of whatever you decide at dot business dot site. But you could buy a web address. Remember that's called the domain and it costs like $12. But take advantage of all of uh, Google My Business's free resources. There's a ton of them. Uh, and if there's anything you take away today, it's to claim your Google My Business profile. I wanted to shout out to Social Examiner. That's a, a video a blog online and it talks about the latest and greatest in social media marketing. Uh, 
the New Mexico Internet Entrepreneurs is a Facebook group created by Barb Tomlin as a forum for New Mexico Internet Entrepreneurs to connect, get helpful tips, and post ideas. The NMS, BDC, and SBA websites have a wealth of, of free learning information, so take advantage of that. The New Mexico Bar Association offers um, a database of attorneys, so if you need help with uh, maybe intellectual property, um, maybe taxation, uh, you could find a list of lawyers who work in that field, or you could pay $35 for them to match you with an attorney for a 30-minute consultation. I put a link in the follow-up email for the IRS Self-Employed Tax Center. If you are a home-based business, this tax center tells you everything you need to know about home-based businesses, regular business, and they have taxes, the virtual workshop which is one of my favorite uh, resources on that website. And then finally, uh, the middle Rio Grande Council of Governments offers traffic counts. So if I was a food truck and I wanted to see how many people pass Main Street in Las Unas a day, because that's where my I want to locate my truck, I could find that information at least for the year before. So those are some awesome resources. And since this is a COVID webinar, I want to go over some of the most up-to-date and um, reputable sources for information related to COVID for small businesses. The first link is to the New Mexico Department of Health's guidance for employers. The second link is for New Mexico Safe Certified Program. And this is a free interactive learning module about how businesses should operate during COVID-19 restrictions. The third link is for OSHA's publication on employer COVID safe practices. The fourth link is information about COVID-19 from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The fifth link and most important in my view is an article by the EEOC called What You Should Know About COVID-19 and the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act and other EEO laws. We are, an ever more, uh, we are in an ever more litigious society, so this is a misfeed for everyone on the call today. Finally, the sixth link is for NewMexico.gov, where you can find the most up-to-date state information related to COVID-19, as well as the lending and grant opportunities for small businesses. And don't forget about the no-cost webinars and learning um, modules from, this, from the Small Business Development Center, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, and the Small Business Administration. And the New Mexico Economic Development Department also has a wealth of information on their website. And if you want to learn more, take my basic steps to starting a business class. Now I want to tell you about how we measure our success. Um, this is how you can help the SBDC. As part of offering our services, we need your help to ensure our services around for many more years. So we ask that you participate in our surveys, report economic impacts because of our assistance to your business advisor or director, and write a letter of support to your local legislators about your experience with the SBDC. All information is kept confidential and is only reported in aggregate to our funders, the state of New Mexico, and the Small Business Administration. Whew. Let's take a breath and let's do a recap. We went over a lot of information, so let's just talk about the main points. Market research and planning is very important. You now have the resources you need to make better educated marketing decisions. So take an hour each month, each quarter, uh, twice a year to review the worksheets from the Small Business Administration's marketing um, handouts and plan your marketing activities carefully. Revisit your target market, revisit your distribution channels and make sure all of that's working for your business. Know your target market. And this is the very least you could do for your business, because if you don't, you'll spend a lot of time and money on promotional activities that don't make a difference in your business. Number three, do you have the skills to set up and manage an online store? Now that you know the major activities involved, does this seem like something you want to do or can do? Number four, did you think online selling was so labor intensive? Now you know. So do you have the staff to answer customer questions, ship and handle returns? Five, if you wanna start a pop-up shop, sell at a flea market or start a food truck, are you able to meet the state, municipal and county requirements and the tax requirements for your venture? And number six, and most importantly, 
Are you prepared to handle the extra cleaning requirements, mandatory capacity limits, and ever-changing regulations for our public safety due to COVID-19? What if your pop-up shop had to close for two weeks because someone in your staff tested positive for COVID-19? This might just kill the business, Finch. I want to go over some SPDs, some um, SBA programs with you. This slide provides contact information for the for SBDC programs, PTAC, which is the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, IBA, or the International Business Accelerator, and the New Mexico Tech Technology Commercialization Accelerator. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center is a government-funded program providing assistance to small businesses who want to sell their goods or services to the government, educational institutions, or tribal entities. The International Business Accelerator is a one-stop shop of resources for New Mexican businesses and individuals wishing to introduce their product or service to the, into the global market. And the New Mexico Tech Technology Commercialization Accelerator offers no cost, confidential counseling regarding intellectual property. This slide continues the list of small business resource partners. So SPOR is the, social, uh, the service core of retired executives. WEST is also known as the Women's Business Center. And VBOC is the Veterans Business Outreach Center. And here's the contact information for your small business support team. We are funded by the SBA and many people ask about uh, SBA learn loans. So I included a link to the SBA resource guide here. If you have questions about SBA loans, definitely reach out to an SBDC counselor or the, your local SBA, or take a look at this uh, PDF that they put out. SBA loans aren't direct loans to businesses, rather they're uh, guarantees to a bank that if in default, you'll get paid back a certain amount of money. They make uh, lending much more appealing to the small business owner or those in underutilized categories like women, Hispanics, Native Americans, veterans. And on page 27 of this, PDF are the SBA lenders. And then up below the SBA lenders is are the um, types of SBA loans. So take a look at that if you're interested. This concludes our slideshow and now I'll answer questions on the Q&A. And I want to thank you before we go for spending time with me today. I got a question from Van. This could be geared towards services as well. Yes, it's to it totally could. Most of the resources we talked about are, are geared towards both products and services. Uh, finding your target market is the same for products as it is for services. Google My Business works for product uh, uh, retailers and service providers. Um, and the, the only difference is sometimes service providers tend to be home-based. The only thing that gets tricky with service providers is um, the zoning requirements for getting a business license. So if you have any further questions about that, you know, type them in or seek the advice of an SBDC counselor. Okay, David, I'm interested in a website and e-commerce. Any other ideas, artists and art galleries, thanks. Um, if you're an artist and you're selling through a gallery or you're selling through, it, it just depends. So if you were selling through a gallery, that's your main channel of distribution. You just wanted a small uh, web presence. I would just get, take advantage of that Google My Business profile and get that free website. I don't think you need anything too big. If you wanted to sell your products online, um, I, I would consider first a marketplace like Etsy or eBay. And then if that doesn't work for you, you could always go into a WYSIWYG website editor, something like Wix, GoDaddy, WordSpace that have an e-commerce attachment to them. But remember, it's what works best for your target market. 
And how are your target market purchasing these products or services? David, what about Wix? Wix is, uh, I like Wix. It's gotten a little bit more difficult to use in the, in its later days. Um, but Wix, GoDaddy, WordPress, Weebly. Um, if I'm, if, I, if you weren't that tech savvy, Weebly would probably be a great option. If you were a little bit more tech savvy, Wix, or WordPress would be better options. Uh, I don't find that there are many issues with Wix. I think it's a pretty straightforward site. I think Weebly's easier for those who are not less tech savvy. GoDaddy's a little bit harder, but it's harder to mess things up in GoDaddy. What about being in the county versus the city? So if you're in the county, some, the county oftentimes have, have, has more lax uh, planning and zoning requirements than the city. Um, tax rates tend to be lower in the county. So if I sold something really high end online, say I sold jewelry and I was located in Valencia County, the tax rate would be about 6.5%. If I did it in the city of Albuquerque, the village of Los Unas, um, the tax rate would be more about 8.5, 8.6%. So you could save people about 2%. Um, if you sold something solely online, it wouldn't really matter where you based your business. P property in the county tends to be cheaper than property in the city. Um, if you had something like a food truck or you were offering providing services um, in rural areas, you would most likely be doing business in the county. It just depends on where your target market is uh, and where there's a need and how you're going to distribute. So just, you know, keep those few things in mind. The major things that stand out in my mind are the tax rate and the, the zoning, zoning requirements and the cost of commercial property. So if you were to start a business in Belen, you were selling solely on, you were distributing your products solely online, you could buy a nice warehouse space for maybe $250,000. If you were doing the same in Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, it could double, triple the price of your, your warehouse. Ben asks, where do we get access to that? I'm not sure what that is. Oh, where do you get access to the new UNM website? Act? You don't have access to that. Only SPDC counselors have access to that. So if you want to explore the data within things like Data Excel, or what they, it used to be called Reference USA, Mintel Marketing Reports, or IBIS World, you have to create an appointment with the SBDC staff person and we could pull those reports for you. You do have access, however, to the New Mexico Council of Governments, Traffic Counts, and the Census Business Builder. But if you're new to these sort of things, it's taken me a long time to learn the ins and outs of these. Please make an appointment with me or somebody in the SBDC and we could help you better use those, those things. And, and Chris, I, I wanted to jump, sorry, I wanted to jump in, but we did have a we did have question in the chat and it basically said, well, and it said, thank you for this presentation. It was informative and resourceful. My question is how long the SBDC will work with us? And you know the answer to this, and I, I want you to bring that up because it's really important. Well, there are no limits to how much no-cost counseling or how many no-cost webinars you could attend. Um, it just depends on your, your particular business problem and the availability at the center. And a new thing that's happening in the SBDC is you can consult no matter where you're located with any of our advisors throughout the state. So if you need information on a more specific topic and somebody has that information, say in Deming, you could consult with the advisor in Deming. So, you know, and feel free to contact me or Leslie if you want to get in touch with the um, advisor or get any of that research you might need. What do you we think? Also, Did that cover it? I think so. And that's great. I, I, um, I hope they don't worry about that our services are on a time frame for them so they're there to help you with whatever you need help with and uh, Chris we had a couple emailed questions come in uh, one is uh, and I don't know if you've covered this but um, our website has wished to add wishes to add PayPal 
but what other options are there besides making website allow payments? So most, most big uh, website providers will allow you to offer PayPal payments. They ex uh, uh, the payment processes accept a variety of different credit cards, debit cards. Um, we've offered classes in accepting Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I always get a kick out of those. Uh, it just depends what your platform is for your website. But as long as you take the, the major credit cards, I think you'll be perfectly fine. The other question that came in is very specific and uh, I, I don't know if uh, we have some options on this, but uh, for artists, um, I think for any kind of creative um, product that you have for sale, what are kind of the basics of what a sh website should have some and some marketing options? For artists, it's very dependent on the target market. So if most artists in New Mexico, you know, if you're a Native American artist in New Mexico, a lot of the times you'll put your stuff on consignment or wholesale to a gallery. And maybe you just want a website with your name, a little bit about you and some of your items, just so you have an online resource and then you want to direct people to that gallery. Um, if you're an artist who's wanting, like a production artist who's wanting to sell online, really think about the products you're offering and is it worth selling online? If you're gonna sell one item a month and it's a $3,500 item, that makes sense. It also makes more sense for that to be seen in a gallery. Um, but I think a rule of thumb just for most of my artists, having a, sm a small online presence without an e-commerce store like the Google My Business website works for them. Uh, it would really depend on what kind of art you sell and how people are consuming it. And I think galleries probably work best for that. Um, galleries often have online stores and they do they take a commission usually from you where they buy straight out and they use their profits, part of their profits to uh, to better market your product. So really think think to yourself, what is my what, where is my target market going to buy these products? Or it could be something like a marketplace like Etsy or eBay. Thank you. That was the last of the questions that came in via email. Perfect. Thank you, Leslie. Let's see, Van asked, where could I find tax rates for operating in a county outside or outside of my county uh, as a commercial drone operator? So you don't have a physical location. You would be, you probably home based. You'd have a business nexus in the area where you, where you have the business. Let me get out of this. And I'm glad you asked the question about gross receipts tax rates because they're gonna to totally change in July. The, the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department's totally changing the way they um, calculate gross receipts tax. But the place to find the rates is from the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department. They have a gross, they put out a gross receipts tax schedule, to, um, one for January through June and then July through December. I, most of the, this site has a bunch of information on it. I usually go to Google. Type in gross receipts tax rates or tax rate schedule. And I look for the, the website that's taxnewmexico.gov. And they have a tax rates map. They also have a publication where they um, list lists all the, the gross receipts tax rates for the state of New Mexico. So you could just use the map, you could click on it and it gives you a, a link to the schedule, which is what I wanted in the first place.
And then you, this is where you really want to go. So I'm going to chat over this link right now to everybody on the call. And you want to go to the current year gross receipts tax rate schedule, January through June. And then this lists all the gross receipts tax rates across the state of New Mexico. So in Valencia County, where I'm located, we have high tech gross receipts tax rates. So if you're in Bosque Farms, look, it's 8.5%. Um, that's kind of high. If you're in places like, if you're on the Pueblos, the Pueblos never had to pay gross receipts tax before. Now they have gross receipts tax rates they have to collect. So just looking at the different tax rates, these are taxes that you could pass on to your customers. You might recognize them as the uh, percentage that we have to pay when we go to Walmart and purchase our stuff. Um, but if you are a home-based business, you use Typically, you, you have to get a, a temporary business permit wherever you're located. This is this would be like for contractors, or you could have a business nexus and only have to pay based on your location. Um, if you're, say you're in Socorro County, what I like about Socorro County is you don't actually need a business license to operate in Socorro County. And the tax rate is pretty low most of the time. Let's see, Socorro. Yeah, the tax rate in, in Socorro County tends to be very low, even in the city. And it's a great option for you. Another great resource for finding information on your tax liability is the IRS. Is the Small Business Tax Center from the IRS, and that's the Small Business and Self-Employed Tax Center. This is a one-stop shop for anything you want to educate yourself about related to small business taxes. And then they have, of course, the Small Business Tax Workshop. And if you are a business without employees, I recommend the first uh, five lessons. If you're a business with employees, take all eight. Okay, I see we're pretty much on time. I'm going to open it up for questions for those of you who can't type into the, the chat box or the Q&A box. If you want to raise your hand and speak a question, you're welcome to do so. And if not, I will open it up to Leslie to make any closing remarks. And I will thank you too for spending time with me today. Thanks, Chris. And uh, I'll give everyone just a couple, um, just a little bit longer to type your questions in. But I want to remind you that you can also, we send you the follow-up uh, information with the presentation slides and all the links. We have lots of live webinars. We also have the uh, on-demand pre-recorded webinars that go up after this one is over. If you want to revisit a certain section and feel um, like you miss something, like I always do, <laughs> you'll have that available. Then it goes up to our YouTube channel. So you have other ways to watch it. And we also have basic steps starting in just a couple of minutes. So thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Leslie, and see you in a few.